call this meeting to order. We can begin with the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next up, presentation of awards and proclamations, and we don't have any this evening. So moving on to agenda item C, public participation on any matter related to board responsibilities. Does anybody in the public want to come forward? I will remind everyone listening at home that our phone lines are open. Our phone number to call is 860-665-8736, and we do have a member of the public stepping forward. If you could please state your name and address for the record. Um, my name is Emerald Zico, and the address is 64 Dover Road in Newington, Connecticut. Thank you. Um, the reason why we're here today is um, we're running into an issue with my daughter. Um, she's in first grade this year, and because we are close to the school, um, she can't, she's not able to get the bus. She can't get into the bus, even though one of the buses goes by our house. Um, she's only six. And um, I'm very concerned for her to walk to school. Um, part, half of the way for her to get to the school, there is no sidewalk. And um, knowing in uh, wintertime how the street gets, and it's kind of we are the last ones to be clouded, I definitely don't feel safe letting her walk to school by herself. Um, the only cross board that we have for her, it's right in front of Anna Reynolds School. By the time she gets to the school, she has to cross the street twice. And I really don't feel comfortable with her going to school by herself or walking to school. So that's why we're here today. My husband and I both work. There is no way for us to drive her to school in the morning. I'm going to um, thank you for your comments. And if you did end up having some kind of hearing with the schools over this, we shouldn't be hearing you right now because we'd be acting as the decision-making body for that. So I'm going to have to say thank you and um, cut you off. I'm really sorry about that. Can you tell her what she should do? Yeah. I mean, I I, was, yeah, I'm really disappointed that that's the answer that I got. I mean, we, 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 no, we, we legally end. can't listen right. to the, the details unless you request a hearing before the board through the process. I because did request a hearing, and because I didn't get a response, I, d I did get a response, but I was just trying to move forward and find a way that we can be helped. Right. So the next thing is to request from my office a uh, hearing with the Board of Education. Okay. Then, I wasn't sure that I had to do that, but yes. thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Is there anybody else who wants to speak or call in? 860-665-8736. Yes, Ms. Resilient. Does she understand the process that we that Not she needs all. to follow? We will send it out to you in the mail tomorrow. Okay. Okay. Okay, seeing no other members of the public coming forward, we will move on to Agenda item D, consent agenda for the approval of our minutes. Uh, Mr. Vesela is not here, so could I have Mr. Tufel go ahead with that? Let's see. Did somebody make a motion to approve the consent agenda as it is written? Second. All in favor? And that's unanimous. Thank you. Item number E on the agenda, old business. We have none. So moving forward to new business. We have a report. New business number one on the capital improvement projects. Mr. Tufelt, you are up. Uh, the faculty committee, facilities committee, excuse me, met on September 13th for a review of the needs of the district and the board's priorities and the facilities and support for 
21st century of learning. Uh, if you bear with me a moment. Mr. Jack Moats, is there anything you want to add to this? If you'd like to, yes. Okay, okay the uh, uh, meeting on the 13th of September was uh, preliminary in nature. It was to review the proposals and craft a proposal for the board CIP account proposal as well as the town CIP account proposal that will ultimately be vetted as part of the uh, overall town budget process in the winter and spring next year. Uh, on page five of the document is the proposal for uh, the upcoming year plus four out years on the public school CIP fund. This is the fund where we have the $125,000 uh, mandatory appropriation from the town. We receive revenues that accrue to this account as a result of tuition activity, building rentals, and investment income. Okay. Uh, at the current status of the account, we have slightly over $500,000 of undesignated funds within this particular account. So you can see that the uh, project request for fiscal year 18-19 total $915,000 compared to a revenue item of $400,000. This will keep the account in balance. You know, since we have 515 to designate plus $400,000 in new revenues, we will, you know, our income will equal our proposed expenses. And then in the out years, uh, we have 400,000 in and 400,000 dollars out. Uh, the revenue is always uh, susceptible to both timing issues as far as when organizations pass. We do get a substantial reimbursement from the. City of Hartford for the Open Choice Program for special ed expenditures uh, that are incurred. But if that doesn't come in by June 30th, you know one year's number is low, while the other number is artificially inflated. So what we try to do with this is the really the smaller of the two capital improvement projects where uh, we typically try to use this to backstop a number of quasi maintenance renovation efforts around the district replacing carpeting, changing up furniture, painting, uh, window work, door work, all of the things that by themselves are not really a large enough project to go through a full public bidding arrangement, but it uh, supplies a very necessary niche of uh, activity to keep our buildings in good shape. Okay, So you can see from the sc scope of the different projects that are here, we really try to cut across all of the potential needs of the Board of Ed to uh, you know, be able to address issues as they come up year to year. Okay. Anybody have any questions on this page before? Um, can you explain that five hundred fifteen thousand dollars again? Correct. Uh, you were to look at the reconciliation of the account uh, as of June thirtieth. The undesignated balance in the account is five hundred fifteen thousand three hundred dollars, give or take a couple dollars. As Without designating money in the account to specific projects, it's not accessible to the board to act on. Okay, so by not reappropriating it or, or requesting that it's reappropriated to specific needs for ourselves, we basically bottle that money up and prevent ourselves from accessing it. Okay, it has to be done as part of the overall budget process every year. I don't get to add items uh, without specific council action. Uh, after until after January 1st of any one year. So this is anticipating what our needs will be, anticipating what our uh, revenues will be for the upcoming year. So the 515 came from last year? Yes. And, and we're carrying and, and it? I believe some even from the year before that because of the timing when you, you guys remember we're putting the budget request in, in November, December time frame. We won't know until six, seven months later how a year is unfolding and then we're catching up either the following year or even two years out of times depending on what happens. Thank, thank you. Um, does this end the um, underground storage tanks for the district? No, this was just uh, phase one. We did 
Anna Reynolds and Ruth Chafee. Uh, we still have the high school, uh, Elizabeth Green, uh, John Patterson, and Martin Kellogg to do. So this 100000 is just for right, it's part the, of it? Part of it, right. The first two we did cost somewhere in the vicinity of $45,000. Know, we okay. had changed the strategy to, from uh, replacement to just removal. You know, based on the economic conditions today, there really wasn't an economic justification to put a new tank back in the ground for another forty to fifty thousand dollars. When uh, the cost to just buy uh, natural gas in the open market is so much more favorable, you know, that's an issue we'll address down the road if necessary. So to finish all of them, it will require additional money yes. in future years. We just all right. I think we have about twenty thousand dollars left on last year's appropriation, plus one twenty. This will cover at least three quarters of where we need okay. to go. Okay, and then in the future, we would expect to see maybe next year, if there's a carryover from this year, that would be something added on. Yes, I think our uh, EPA mandatory timeline on this takes us two years out from now being to 2021, and then we'll be done with okay. tank removal. Mr. Silvio? Oh, thank you. So we have more tanks yes. to address, but we, we haven't forecasted those expenditures into future years? Yeah, well, $100,000 for starters. And that'll take us through the next round of uh, taking the tanks out of the ground. Then we'll reassess what the additional money is to finish the project. Okay, this will actually be over minimum three years, possibly four. But I heard you say 2021, we might have to do a few more tanks. Because that'll be the end of it. The last ones will come out of the ground in 2021. Right. So we don't need any money reserved for it by then? This will cover part of We, As I said, we have about $20,000 left from the first uh, appropriation with 100000 This probably will cover paying for three out of the four tanks that are left. And then if there is, if we can get all four done, that's fine. But well, we're safe only to say that the next year's plan would have the remainder of it yes, once, we, right, yeah, right, once right. we get an idea. All right, thank you. Ms. Guyon, do you have a question? No, I think just a clarification that when we look at this page, there's money in it for this coming for next year, but then not money going forward. I think that's the confusion. Correct. Right. I would not want to commit a major financial outlay to it where it would be minimal, you know, probably under $20,000 to finish. Okay. And we'll just, when we're back at the table next year for this, I'll have a much clearer idea of where we are at that point to give a good projection. Any other questions? Okay. Let's oh, okay. Mr. Tufa. And then on the uh, project title for the 2018 to 2023 CIP, the priorities were adjusted, starting with one and working all the way up through nine. And also and on the page six. on page six, and the uh, <coughs> monies have been adjusted across. The funding for these projects. Okay, thank you. All right, so yes, Mr. Sylvia. Um, this brings me back to a discussion we had a few months back, or maybe more than a few months, which was the feasibility study to really know how much work we really need to do on all of our facilities. Um, you know, I know that this is an educated swag mm -hmm. um, of what we anticipate we need to spend but I'm wondering if is it the right time for us to get the feasibility study so we have a real clear picture and can communicate that out to the uh, community that beyond Ann and Reynolds we're going to need X amount more for this 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 and this and I mean have a professional engineer under that feasibility study that you shared with us um, I, I think it's still a great idea to try to get accomplished it's a great idea as well, and I think what we talked about at the facilities committee meeting was involving the entire town so that uh, you can get an idea of what the needs were across the town. Uh, because of the cost of it, it would need to go through the town bidding process, um, and it would need to be done through the town. Um, so I would recommend, if, if the board wishes, to uh, get together with the uh, town folks or the council and see if you want to develop a feasibility study for the town buildings. That would be best. Can I add something to that? Yeah. One of the other aspects that is part of the board purview is deciding on what initiatives they want to pursue. Okay. Uh, a feasibility study 
of existing buildings, existing conditions, really only deal with repair, renovation, and extension of useful life of the facility. Some of the items that you have on the books here are for uh, community-wide preschool uh, capabilities. Now that would entail in all likelihood either a major addition on one of our properties or acquiring another property to get there. And these are the things that really need to go through a more formal board vetting as far as where does the board want to go and design a long-term plan before we actually try to react to it and create a, a response. An engineer or an architect's uh, ability to deal with that will only be based on what we tell them we are looking for for the future. You won't get an argument from me on that one, Lou. I mean, I'm, I was ref referencing the feasibility study on our existing assets. What do, what do we have to really repair? We all know Anna Reynolds needs to be addressed, and, mm -hmm. and we're pushing for the building committee on that. But I'd really like to have a five-year vision of the types of other restorations that we need to potentially bond for if we have to really go and fix the roofs, if we really have to go get those air conditioners done, if we have to really do some road repairs and such on our existing assets. Mm -hmm. um, I think your plan does go out five years, the one you have there. That should go out five years. Yes. Yep. But these numbers are a swag, right? I mean, uh, Based on market yeah, value. They're more than uh, a swag, you know, right. for any construction related uh, work. Because of prevailing wage laws, the uh, code demands that the state places on any community to build a school. Uh, best case, you're going to get $350 a square foot. You know, for a more expensive or sophisticated project, you'll move up into the $400 a square foot range. It's really just a matter of targeting the size. So, uh, Think of an illustration of a preschool uh, arrangement where you're going to decide I want to have 20 classrooms available to handle you know a full community uh, preschool center and you know a classroom with related spaces that goes with it for lavatories offices you know pull out centers the quarter space uh, the main office you would be going 1250 <coughs> excuse me, square foot per classroom like uh, in a module so just extrapolating that, you know you're going to need a building in the 25,000 square foot range to address that need. And at $400 a square foot, you're talking close to a million dollars for the, uh, excuse me, $10 million for the build out of that. That's there. You know, certainly if you're in a secondary market and trying to retrofit a facility, you know, you have a whole different set of cost structures and issues to uh, deal with. You know, if you're acquiring a facility, you do have to get state permission that they'll allow you to put it on the roster of uh, an accepted uh, school building because you will be able to meet code. You're making a commitment to do that rather than um, acquiring a facility that is you know, substandard from the state's code perspective and trying to just make do. So there's a lot of checks and balances in the system that have to be uh, considered in designing the overall plan of where the uh, board would like to forecast a vision for the community for the future. As long as you brought up preschool, the, the, the plans have to be uh, submitted to the state by Pamela. What are, when do we have to have our plans submitted to the state, 2021 or 2019? Um, we have to be open by 2022 and plans okay. by 2019. Okay. So we have to have a plan by 2019, and we have to be open by 2022. Um, Preschool. Details for everyone? Yes. Well, right. They're going to give us the requirements in 2019. Right. And we're supposed to be open by 2022, which means you... finalized. Right. So you have your proposal that would uh, call for uh, consolidated preschool in 2020? I can't. I, I don't have. Bob, I gave you my my plan, so I don't know. Um, I can't remember what year it was. Seven point six. Yeah, we have the an allocation for discussion here for nineteen twenty. Twenty. Okay. Twenty. So, but again, these are all fluid as far as where the community wants to take it. If it's we don't want this, but we want something else, or we want this much bigger, much different. Uh, added on to an existing facility if we have the 
uh, land space available to build out additionally on a property. Those are all considerations that go into this. So, uh, you know, in the work we've done with architects in the past, uh, many times you commission an architect to do the uh, the visionary piece of this to come up with conceptual, you know, two line drawings of what the expectation is, what the approximate sizes will be, and uh, trying to fit it into the community uh, network of possible solutions, you know, where we can, where we can put it. So uh, a lot of times the engineers are really just reacting from once they're provided a set of construction documents or a uh, specific uh, set of uh, renovation requests uh, to act on. And that really isn't, it's going to be out of context. It won't necessarily provide you the answer you're looking for, I think. Thank you very much, Ken. Are we ready to move on now? I just want to bring up one more, one more point. If you can I turn your attention to page six, um, we have a little bit of an issue uh, in that uh, if you look at the bus replacement program, there's $220,000 that was uh, adopted by the council. Um, we are in a position now where our third 71 passenger school bus um, that is uh, 10 years of age or more uh, requires about a $14,000 repair. Um, I don't see the financial um, sense in doing that. Um, however, the town has not released the funding for the, uh, the school buses. So that is still sitting in the in the uh, capital fund and it's, we're not able to use it. So I just want you to be aware that we are three buses down um, as of today. Is this a timing issue? Well, um, we are running out of buses. Well, so Maybe I did pose the question correctly. The CIP funds are there from the town, yes. but they just haven't been released to us yes. so that we can write a check for the bus. Yes, yes. or order the bus. So to me, it sounds like a timing issue. But can you well, clarify why? Well, they normally are available July 1st. Um, they have not been released yet. There's been a spending freeze um, for the board anyway, for uh, capital items. Correct. The, the, we cannot write a contract against those dollars. You know, the town is basically held off on releasing our CIP number. I can't speak for the town side because I haven't looked at their <coughs> item by item. You know, without in speculating about what their motives are, it, I would suspect they're trying to keep their options open for what they would do if you get very bad news from the state on whatever budget is uh, ultimately approved. So, okay, so... It, speculation I could probably understand that kind of speculation that mm -hmm. they're sort of waiting for what is the budget decisions from the state uh, possibly po that's my personal suspicions but right. I don't have well, any right. clue right. to I have it's no not clue that I've, I've never asked on it to okay okay so unfortunately that doesn't change our situation no it doesn't but have you I'm sorry have you asked why no I didn't on that so I think that would be a good idea yeah you know, well we were told everything's right. you know, f frozen, you know, oh, okay. uh, as far as, you know, the basic we're waiting on the state budget. I assume nothing has changed in the last two months right. to change their opinion of why it's on hold. So right. this is a town manager decision? I, from somewhere from the town side. I'm not sure if it was a town council well, action. Or was town management oriented Yes, it would be somewhere so. on the town government side the decision emanated from. Okay. But I'm not sure if it was a council action that the town I, managers... Is I don't recall any council action yeah. or discussion on this. Right. It could be just an informal, just sit tight for a while, so... Okay, thanks. Yes, Mr. Shulman. Um, just to, for clarification purpose, because this comes up whenever we bond out, have a possible bonding five years out, it says Patterson and Kellogg in 2022, 2023. My assumption is that those are in that year because we go five years out and that's the fifth year, but... Those aren't things that have to be done in 2022 and 2023. No, we want to keep them on the radar, so that's why they're in that fifth column. And you'll see that Patterson is down to $10 million because we have been going through that building. We've we finished the air conditioning. We are working on the heating now. Um, so we're, we're, that number keeps coming down, and we're hoping to get it down even further than that. So when we do have to renovate what's left, it will be a re drastically reduced amount. 
Uh, same thing with Kellogg. Thank you, Mr. Shulman. Okay, moving on to item number three in new business. No, item number two in new business, healthy food certification. Who wants to discuss that? I'll take it. Okay. Everybody loves me tonight. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, if you can recall back in the spring, uh, there's the traditional annual board action for renewing our participation in the healthy food certification. At the time that motion was made, it was silent about allowing the, uh, 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 what's the exact language here? Yeah, allowing exemptions from the standards. This allows us flexibility of what we do at concession stands, like up at the uh, football field house right. and other places. Uh, since the original motion was silent, we are up on a uh, uh, program review this year, and we felt it was important to have absolute clarity about that because it could create a technical violation mm -hmm. if we don't uh, get things aligned properly. So this is just a housekeeping uh, motion at this point. It has absolutely no effect on anything. Right. It's pretty self-explanatory. Yeah. So if someone could read the motion. Thank you, Mr. Shulman. Uh, move the Board of Education uh, provide exemptions from the Healthy Food Certification Program in the following manner. Exemption for food items. The Board of Education will allow the sale to students of food items that do not meet the Connecticut nutrition standards provided that the following conditions are met. One, the sale is in connection with an event occurring after the end of the regular school day or on a weekend. Two, the sale is at the location of the event. And three, the food items are not sold from a vending machine or school store. Can I have a second? Sharon? All those in favor? Discussion, please. Okay, discussion. Thank you. What about the holidays? Well, I can't hear you. I'm sorry, Robert. We have a holiday once in a while. It's Thanksgiving Day game. If it's on Thanksgiving morning, that would be a holiday. Okay, so maybe we should amend the motion to say on a weekend or holiday? I would be fine with that. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, could someone move to amend the motion? Make a motion to amend the motion. Okay. To someone's... include a holiday instead of weekend. Right, to say and say on a weekend or holiday, oh, to add addition. that word. Okay. Uh, I'll second, that. second that. Okay. All in favor of amending the motion per Mr. Tufelt's explanation right there. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Now okay, so we've voted to amend the motion that has passed. Any discussion on that? Okay, so now we're going to vote on, yes? <laughs> I hate to bring any difficulties to the situation, but um, so I, I just wonder by saying um, a holiday, um, it might not designate whether it is a school day or not, because we are, let's say, Veterans Day having school. So um, as such, might it be better to say um, regular school day or a non-school day, opposed to holiday? Just a thought, I just don't want you all to vote on something that might put us in another precarious situation. Anybody have any comments to make towards that? <laughs> so why do you even put the word school in? Just say on a day. No, it's at the end of a regular school day or a non-school day. Right. So it can't be during school hours. So instead of saying weekend at all, just have it say the end of a regular school day or on a non-school day. Correct. That oh, that would be clean. I would agree with that. Okay, so we have to... Um, sure. We are. Uh, uh, no, I I'll, think that I'll, makes sense. I, I, I move to amend the motion uh, at the end of number one to say regular school day or on a non-school day. Second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Okay, so do I think we have to no, vote down the other one, right? <laughs> no, we're, we're no. good. Okay, all right, so let's, we've discussed it. All those in favor of the amended motion as Mr. Shulman just stated? Right. Everybody in favor of that? Aye. 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 Okay. So could we just get clarification? So it's going to say the sales in connection with an event occurring after the end of the, regu of the regular school day or on a non-school day. 
that's what we just passed. Okay. Correct. Thank you. <clears throat> Moving on to new business number three, budget guidelines. Dr. Collins. Go ahead. Move the Board of Education approve the budget guidelines for the 2018-2019 school year as reviewed on September 13th, 2017. Second. Now time for discussion. Okay, so we have the budget guidelines. I just want to, um, they are very similar as in past years. Uh, I do want to remind everyone that we are beginning the budget process about $1.8 million in deficit. Uh, that is that we used borrowed money to operate and to fund this year's salaries. So we are starting at $1.8 million below zero. I just want to make everybody aware of that. So when the number comes in far higher than it we usually do, um, that everybody remembers why. Um, it was the decision that was made uh, to fund salaries I get that. through um, borrowed money. Uh, or, uh, so that, that's where we begin. Um, we have several mandates that have not stopped uh, that will need to be done. Um, and we have um, some things that have, have obviously been deferred. So we are, we are looking at a, what was likely to be a very high budget number at a time when the governor may be pulling the rug out from underneath um, the community with regard to state funding. Um, so I just want to make everybody aware of that so when that number comes in that uh, there isn't a surprise that we understand why that this is happening. Any further discussion, Mr. Silvia? Well, thank you. So, Dr. Collins, um, I have a different perspective on this hole that you just explained and that we're below zero, all right? We did experience a number of life events over the course of the two years that did provide us with an opportunity to find um, locations in the prior budgets for us to set aside um, prior allocated funds, and they did total to $1.8 million. And I know that we've basically carried over the uh, $1.2 million. I don't view it as a whole. I view it as um, the hard work of the NPS staff has finding opportunities for us to, um, I'm going to use the word save, but it's probably not the right word, but to find opportunities within the prior budgets that we could have additional funds available to us to reallocate. <laughs> Having said that, um, I will be eager to see what the staff recommends and what you will uh, also support and recommend. But I, I just can't accept the concept that we're in a hole. We have $70 million, and we have to figure out how to leverage those funds to provide the best education we can to our students. So I'm coming at it from a much different perspective. Um, and so the language of saying that we're in a hole it, it's just not, it's not meeting my I perspective. Used the word deficit. Or a deficit. I don't see the deficit. Why don't we let Mr. Shulman speak? Thank you. I, I was just going to say, if, if I was just looking for any discussion on the actual guidelines, because I think that's what we're voting on and discussing. Well, I, I think that that is in, in the penumbra. penumbra, but penumbra the guidelines don't say that we're working from a hole and that we're working from a deficit. Okay, well, thank you, Mr. Silva. Any further comments? Can somebody read the motion? Oh, we did. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Point that we've had the same <laughs> priorities, and I, I, they're important priorities, but the order is more or less the same. They're, diff they're different this year. They're different. We changed the order? Yeah, there's guidelines, regard I, I believe, at the end regarding special education outplacements, breakage. Um, okay. Those are the two. Okay. Those All are right. It's based off different. of the priorities we set as a board. 
and expanded. Right. Okay. Right. Remember, they changed the special ed. We've always budgeted um, net amount on the special ed, and they, they changed the rules this year, so we can no longer do that. And also, we have experienced, um, as Mr. Sylvia said, some life experiences, but it seems that the people we are replacing are at the higher end. So whenever we have somebody like a math teacher or a science teacher who's going out and retiring, we, we know we're not going to find them at the plans rate. So we want to make sure we budget accordingly so that we don't get ourselves into a bind. But just those. If it's an elementary teacher, obviously we'll budget at the, the, the plans rate. I think a lot of the, um, the the idea behind this is to be as transparent as possible, and that's why all these guidelines were written that way. Right. People get confused over when they, they, they don't they see a certain dollar amount, especially for your special ed, when that amount in there is a, a net am amount, and um, because where does that other money come from? So that we're trying to put it all out there. Thank you. Item number four. We, oh, Mr. Sylvia, you want to read it again? Sure, sure. Uh, Mr. Shulman. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, move the Board of Education to approve a resolution honoring school cafeteria workers and proclaiming Wednesday, October 11th, 2017, as School Cafeteria Workers Day. Seconded by Bob. Any discussion? No discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Mr. Shulman, you want to take the next one? Move the Board of Education approve the resolution honoring school bus drivers and proclaiming Wednesday, October 11th, 2017 as School Bus Drivers Day. Seconded by Emily. Any discussion? Um, Mr. Sylvia? Uh, just clarity. We're, we're, we're at. We're go on ahead. item number five and new business. Right. So I'm reading that October 11th, we're designating that day for the cafeteria workers, and we're also designating that day as honoring the bus drivers yes and there is the resolution going around if everyone could sign it <clears throat> so okay just I, I thought we would at least pick another day but okay same day two groups any further discussion let's vote all those in favor aye, aye. Moving on to item number six. Who wants to read the motion? Meeting cancellation? I will. Emily? Move the Board of Education cancel the regular meeting scheduled for Wednesday, October 25th, 2017. Second. Mr. Shulman, discussion? Why? Well, I think it's, that's good. We should say what it's for. The, the purpose is to, to honor our Teacher of the Year on that night. That's what it's for. So should we reschedule the October 25th to another night? I think we traditionally use that night to honor the teacher of year and we schedule, we cancel the meeting every, every year. Oh, all right. It's just my, something that we do. My ignorance. Okay. Thank you. All those, all those in favor. Aye. Aye. Okay, meeting passes. And then we're on to item number seven, which we don't need to take any action on any further, but Dr. Collins, would you like to explain what happened? Right, so the, we're actually, this is, we're calling this the Nevermind Memo. Uh, if you remember at the last board meeting, I said we, we may need to change the calendar. Um, the, um, because the, the board needs to operate in, in line with the town services. So if the town hall was going to be closed, we would not be able to be open because we need to get our kids to school on the buses. We need to get to feed them at lunch. The secretaries need to answer the phone. And so everybody, need, we, it's either everybody or nobody. Um, since then, uh, the town manager and AFSCME have, um, have met and um, the town manager has reversed and they will be open on Veterans Day, which means we will be open on Veterans Day. So there is absolutely no change, so there's no action required from the board at this time. I think it's a good time to also reiterate the plan for that day at school. Right. One of the things I ask the teachers to do, since we are going to be here, is very often, I shouldn't say all, but some of our kids don't necessarily understand why they have the day off. And it's a very important day, and we want to make sure that it is, the time is spent, um, since we will be in school, uh, to honor those men and women who have, who have served our country. And um, 
Mexico. Some have paid the ultimate sacrifice. So they will be doing a variety of activities uh, throughout the day, um, depending on the school and the classroom. Um, obviously, we're not going to police that, but uh, but I know our teachers, and I know that they will do right by our veterans. Mr. Shulman? I know we've talked about it before, and I've, I've had a few conversations with the folks of the American Legion, um, that there are at least a handful, if not quite a few more vets in our own community that would love the opportunity to be Absolutely. able to come in as guest speakers in some of the classrooms right. for a limited time. Right. Um, I know they, they were they were actually very excited when I talked to them about potentially being open in the future on Veterans Day because they'd love a chance to connect with the kids. And, and they have some great activities that they, they do also that I think that we've talked about, the oratorical contest that's free for our kids but can result in scholarships. So it's a good time for them to plug that for kids to get scholarships and and for them to be able to talk about their actual service to bring a, a real face to it. So I, I hope that we do reach out to to them and um, and, and, right. and make that happen. We've got Victory Gardens right in the back of the high school, so we've, we've got m multiple opportunities. We really do. Yeah, so I, I'd, I'd love to hear more about our plans um, once, yeah. they, once it gets a little closer to it. Yeah, that, this that is the kind of thing where I don't mind them taking the day and actually doing other things besides right. what they usually do. Now, if some of the veterans do want to come in, who sh whom should they contact? The teachers or at the individual schools will be handling that on, uh, by school. Okay. Um, so I'll uh, send something out to the principals and let them know. Um, you know, get in touch with them. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. We're moving on to agenda item G, superintendent of schools report. Okay. Now we'll be brief. Uh, this is... Um, our first opportunity really to look at the enrollment to see where we are. Uh, there is one, I don't know if, if yours has been corrected, but the outplay students, um, the projected was 49, it should say 51. If yours does not say 51, please change that. Uh, the magnet schools we were projecting at 172, there are 201. The preschool was projected at 57 or at 61. And to be at 61 in September is enormous because we, we usually have room um, throughout the year as, as students turn three or four uh, to, to bring them in. But we are at past capacity in September. That's unbelievable. So to, to say that we don't we need a preschool is an is a, is a intense understatement. Um, but we are obviously over, um, by this count, uh, by 81 or 82 students above projected. Um, our classrooms are full. Uh, so I know that, the, I mean, 61 kids in preschool, that is full. Uh, and as children turn three and need services, how do we accommodate Classrooms that? Classrooms get bigger. And we'll have to hire more no. tutors in the classroom? No, we just get bigger. But aren't there uh, ratio numbers that have to be maintained? We try, but we just don't have the staff. It's strive to language. Okay. Unless you have a PPT strive and an IEP to. that says one on one or something. Well, these students are primarily special needs students. They're right. in our preschools. So, Mr. Selvia is questioning that. So, when you're do when you're providing programming for special education preschool children, the strive to language is that we, they want 50 for 50. Peers, 50 50 peers, peers and special ed children. And it, it's vital for us to keep as close to possible to that. However, because they're aware that issues like this happen in schools, all in school towns, the language is strive to language. So, yes, we are out of compliance when we go above that with the strive to language. So, we're, it's really, we really should be striving to keep a 50 50 ratio. I do want to draw. Oh. I'm talking about teachers, though, in the classroom, adults in the classroom. Right. Yeah, we have no money to, to hire any additional staff. What's the language on that? Oh. Right, the ratio of teachers per students. Right. right. Yeah. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to the expenditure summary report. Um, a matter of a uh, little bit of concern for me is the special education um, line item. If you look, we are in September, and we are 40% expended. Wow. So Which, we, we, on the revised one, I don't see the... 
Oh, it's on the original one. Uh, okay. Expenditure I'm report back. on the last page. Special education, we're at 40 percent expended. So we keep our eye on that, obviously, but we are cutting it very, very close. Um, so that that is likely going to be problematic. Um, we've heard other communities as they as they uh, as they trim their budgets. Um, you know, they cut it very close, and if you have events happen in special ed, with, which you have no control over whatsoever, um, I shouldn't say no control, you do have some, I suppose, but um, the kids need what they need, and you, and you really, uh, this is not an area where you can be cheap. Um, so um, we need to provide for our children, and, um, and it's going to be tight on the money if we are 40% expended in September. I just want to bring that to your attention. And that's why uh, we wanted to keep that contingency fund healthy. And now that's empty. <laughs> Any other comments, questions, Mr. Sylvia? Um, on the carryover funds that we have in the um, non-lapsing fund and, and such that we moved from last year. I believe there's $100 year. left. <clears throat> Pardon? I believe there's $100 left. Is that reflected in this report? No. No. So we've already paid salaries? From the summer. Well, that's moved over. I don't know if Lou's moved it over yet or not. <clears throat> it's, it's not Sorry. It's not finalized yet from a transaction that we have to reconcile with the town, but we're working on it right at this point. But it will utilize the entire balance other than, you know, a small amount, the minimum amount to keep the fund open. Right. So where, I'm, where my head's wrapped, where my mind's wrapped around, Lou, is, is that... The seventy million three eighty nine. That was what was approved for us to have, but correct. but that does not include the one point two million dollars. That's correct. So where is the one point two million dollars distributed amongst these accounts? It's an offset in the five big programs as a negative. Because we will pull the money out of those programs and send it to the non-lapsing fund as an expense. So it'll be a credit on the board side. It'll be an expense on the uh, non-lapsing fund. So okay. we'll, in essence, zero out the non-lapsing fund, and we will receive the benefit of the money coming back to the board through that expenditure transfer. And when you say the big five, that's English language arts, mathematics, music? No, not music. Uh, reading, social Read. studies, and science. Uh, includes mathematics? Yes. And English? Yes. Language. Okay. Those are the five? English, math, reading, science, social studies. Is it possible for me to ask for a breakout of how you did the credits and debits on those five? Yes, just, just 20 percent of the credit. You took 20 percent to each? Right. Okay. all set um is there any reports or things that we get on the on the uh, student activity funds or the uh, chromebook insurance funds the chromebook account is uh, held by the town um so they have that 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 account the town has that account mm -hmm. it's not under our Jurisdiction or prudent? Can explain that. Right. Well, it's a balance sheet account, and the Board of Ed does not have a balance sheet. So it has to reside on the town side of the operation. So we turn all of the money over that we receive in Chromebook insurance payments. It goes into the reserve, and we draw that down uh, when we buy repair parts or replacement equipment. Okay. So the town manages the account. Correct. All right. And what about the uh, student activity fund? Those are all independent. Independent, not managed by who? The town. There's a treasurer for each of the uh, student activity accounts. That's either signed through the uh, teacher B appendix in the teacher contract, or in some of the cases there are other individuals who have been involved for a number of years. 
that so we didn't have an NTA. These are independent of the board? No, these are all reportable back to us through audit, but it's an independent right. fund. Is there an opportunity that we could, in the future, um, have those included in the report so that we can see what the running balance is and the activities that they're spending on? Uh, yeah. We'd have to get that through the town, wouldn't we? No, we'd have to go back to all the treasurers to get a running report. Every month. Right. We typically just get a once-a-year summarization at the end that is what goes up to audit. So that has been the routine practice, but I would just have to request it and create a reporting structure for uh, the various treasurers to compile their information. Right. Maybe you can explain what goes into that account and what it's used for. In the student activity? Yeah, because right. it's, yeah. Yeah, there's probably about, uh, I would say, 10 accounts in total. Each of the schools that is under the jurisdiction of the principal has a school-based student activity account. This is used for field trips, other activities that the school does, some minor fundraising and gift receipt that they get from uh, various sources in the community, and they expend it in conjunction as enrichment to the curriculum or activities for the kids that are there. At the high school, it's a little more sophisticated. Uh, you have a general student activity account which handles the same sort of basics that are there, uh, but there's many more subsets to it, like each of the uh, graduating class has their own line item. They typically create an account for gifting something back to the school based on the money they collect that's there. Uh, you have the music fund, which stands independent, which is all of the receipts and collateral costs to put on the musical and the dramatic uh, productions during the year. Uh, you have uh, the athletics account, which does the same thing to provide those collateral items for uh, all of the various sports teams at the high school level. Uh, say what else is there? So this is something yeah, that's that contained in the audit. So stuff. this is done, it's, it'll, it'll show up in the CAFR every year. Mm -hmm. And right. so this isn't something that we can no. ask uh, from the parents and from, from each individual school every month. It would just be too onerous. It could be. I yeah, it just, not looking just, at the month-to-month yeah. uh, -month details. We're looking at right. the audit integrity of the transactions right. at this point. So. Uh, well, in the basic categories I just described, uh, you know, those funds are taken indirectly by the school. So uh, one of the practices that the district has had for a number of years is you never know when a bus is not going to be available for a field trip because of other scheduling or crises or things like that. So they collect money of anywhere from a dollar to five dollars a trip. And if our bus can cover it, the school will keep that money in their student activity account for the day that the bus garage says we can't cover it, go hire a bus down at DACO or uh, I can't think of the other place in Berlin right now that does a lot of this. New Britain Transportation. Right, New Britain Transportation. Remember, we're three buses down. Right. So, and then they will have to pay the full dollar amount out of that. So there's uh, some of those uh, items that are in there. Uh, the... Uh, their field days for whatever uh, solicitations they're looking for from parents or students for T-shirts or whatever else they're uh, doing doing for the uh, uh, yeah making the activity vibrant uh, for themselves. Uh, sure. Just, yeah, I just wanted to kind of have you clarify that because I know every time I write a check for the school, whether it's for field day, whether the kids are doing something in class, they had a, they have somebody come and do a photography program in fifth grade. Um, if they go on a field trip, every check that I write is to the student activity right. fund. Right. Mm -hmm. Correct. So. Okay. You know better than I do. You're closer <laughs> to the action. <laughs> And we have a separate music account for yes. music rentals and things like that, each school Right, has. and music so. rentals as well, besides the music uh, for the musical at the high school. Right, so. right. Thank you for the explanation. Mr. Sylvia. Um, Dr. Collins, I had one other question under transportation. I know that we had asked previously if we could, that the state required us to run some sort of bus driver report or yes. validation of... Um, it's done every two weeks. Every... Right, but uh, it was. We, I thought we agreed that Mr. Avery would put it in the report that it was run. Okay, Debbie, could you write that down? Yeah. 
Okay. And he has been reporting every it two weeks. Uh, weekly or biweekly to us just over an email blast. So yeah. it has been getting done. I, so. I, I believe I just, yeah. I, I just, it's a check, mental checkpoint for me mm -hmm. so we don't get in trouble with the state again. Mm -hmm. and That's fine. Yeah. I get it every two weeks. Thank you. Anything further? Moving on to Agenda H, public participation on any matter related to board responsibilities. There's no one in the audience. Anybody want to call in? Our phone line is open, 860-665-8736. Any takers out there? Okay, no takers, so we're going to move on to remarks by board members. Mr. Shulman, would you like to start? No. Ms. Dam? Mr. Sylvia? Ms. guy on? Well, yeah. <laughs> So, oh, is that phone ringing? <gasps> is it ringing? It was. Call, call back. back. Oh, please call back. <laughs> I didn't hear it ring either. No, if you don't hear it, you just have to watch the light. Okay. 860-665-8736. Somebody out there wanted to call? You can interrupt. Oh, here we go. Hello, thank you for calling the Board of Ed. Please state your name and address. Hello? Hi, you're on. Hi, this is Patty Foley, 51 Crown Ridge. How are you? Good, how are you? Thanks for calling. Thanks, thanks for having the meeting, except that for the most part, you can't hear most of the people speaking tonight. I have my television on 100% and between I'd say a good portion of everybody is not sitting up to their microphones. It's really disheartening because I can't hear what's going on. And while I couldn't be there tonight in person, I would like to be able to at least hear at home. So um, I know you've been off all summer, so you haven't had a lot of practice with the microphones, but you need to get up closer so we can hear you. Okay, thank you so much for calling. Right. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, Ms. Guy, on your own. Okay. I just want to say, oh, yeah, there we go. I can hear it now. Um, nice job tonight, Jane. Thank you for filling in. Um, and yeah, I guess in the last couple of weeks, I've just had the opportunity to be to go to the open house at the high school. Very exciting. Um, there was just so many parents there. And again, my son is a freshman, so maybe that's part of it, where there was a lot of parents in every classroom that I was in. So it was nice to see. Um, so much community participation in that because uh, it is a great opportunity to get into the school, see the school, kind of meet the teachers. So that was um, pretty exciting. Um, and I guess that's kind of it for today. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. Tufeld? Dr. Braverman? I just wanted to say thank you to all the board members and the staff for flowers and cards that you sent me while I was in the hospital. It means a lot. Uh, helps with speedy recovery. Hopefully I'm hanging in. So thank you very much. It's great to see you. Welcome back. Um, I, I don't really have anything to say except that I attended an NHS open house also. And I love it. Thinking how am I going to juggle two schedules next year when I have two there? But um, yeah, it's, it's a great night. So there's no, nothing else. Somebody move to adjourn, please. Second. Second. All in favor? <laughs> Meeting adjourned at 7.59.